Namaste and welcome everybody to the Transitional Artificial Intelligence Research Group Seminar Series. Today we have uh, Dr. Hassan Farabaksh, who will who is from the Health Bite Group the School of Geosciences at the University of Sydney. And um, Dr. Farabaksh is also part of our group as the Deputy Director. He's uh, leading in areas in machine learning and remote sensing. He has a prominent uh, review paper, which is one of the highly cited upcoming papers published in the uh, general uh, remote sensing and environment in a review of machine learning methods for remote sensing and mineral exploration. Uh, so uh, today, Hassan will continue in that direction and give a presentation in a related area. Thank you, Hassan. You can start. Thank you, Rick. Well, uh, yeah, as Rick said, I'm a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Sydney. I'm currently working with the Earthquake Group there. And uh, well, ma my main research interest is data science applications in mineral exploration. And uh, so in mineral exploration, uh, the thing that we do in, is to we actually integrate different types of exploration data. And one of these data types that is actually remote sensing. And uh, currently I'm actually involved in several projects in which we actually do multi-dimensional multi mineral perspectivity modeling by integrating different layers. But uh, the projects that we have mostly defined for the students working in uh, transitional AI group, and, and they are part of this group. So uh, most of this project, uh, in most of this project, we actually are focused in processing remote sensing data and using machine learning to process these data types. And uh, our main goal is to uh, create geological maps by processing remote sensing data using different machine learning methods, supervised learning, and also unsupervised learning. And today uh, I'm going to present uh, 12 uh, our recent projects in which we used, in one we used uh, uh, unsupervised learning and in the other one we used supervised learning to create geological maps. And uh, when I say geological maps, uh, it's, a, it's actually, a, uh, it covers a broad area. And we have different types of actually geological maps. Uh, and uh, also it includes alteration maps, methodological maps, and also structural maps. Uh, and in one of these projects we target, uh, we actually uh, we were aimed at creating a lithological map. And the other one, we actually aimed for creating a, a altera an alteration map. And I'm quite sure that you have heard about the uh, importance of critical minerals for energy transition and also for, for green economies. And uh, also gradually the depth of exploration and the depth of deposits of uh, these minerals are getting, uh, uh, are actually increasing. And we need to develop uh, and uh, new methods and also frameworks to create more reliable and accurate uh, geological maps and also exploration models. And uh, in these in the projects that we have carried out recently in the group, uh, we try to actually develop uh, innovative frameworks and also apply novel methods, machine learning methods to process remote sensing data and create uh, more reliable uh, geological maps using uh, this type of data and also uh, novel methods. And uh, so since uh, this is actually my first presentation for this group, uh, and so I thought that it might be better to start with uh, an introduction to remote sensing and introduce you uh, uh, what it is, uh, actually introduce you uh, the uh, remote, remote sensing and also different platforms that we have for collecting data. And this is uh, uh, the definition of actually uh, uh, remote sensing, which has been uh, provided by Colwell. And uh, he says that remote sensing is the art, science, and technology of obtaining reliable information about physical objects and the environment through recording, measuring, and interpreting imagery and digital representations of energy patterns derived from non-contact sensor systems. Well, as it, as it is obvious from also the name of, you know, the new remote sensing and also from the definition, we actually, we are aimed at uh, uh, recording and also measuring a physical characteristic without uh, physical contact with our objects. And uh, remote sensing data are collected from different platforms. It can be a a uh, drone or it can be a satellite or even you can put a sensor on the tripod and uh, collect data without any physical contact and they're also they're all under uh, the category of remote sensing well uh, 
we can classify remote sensing uh, platforms uh, into two, passive and also active. Passive in, in passive platforms, uh, the only thing that we had that has been mounted on the platform is a sensor, and the source of energy is the sun. And we actually uh, measure the reflectance uh, from the uh, ground surface. And but in active platforms, uh, in addition to a sensor, we also have it. Uh, we have the source of energy there that actually emits uh, energy in the range uh, in the range of a microwave to the ground surface, and then it actually uh, uh, measures the reflectance and also the intensity of uh, the re reflectance. And uh, but in our work uh, for geological mapping, uh, the data type which is uh, usually used is uh, uh, is collected using passive platforms, and we. Uh, I measure the response that we get from the ground surface uh, uh, from actually, uh, which has been, uh, which is the result of uh, the, the sun. And uh, also in addition to this uh, classification, we can classify remote sensing into two other categories as well, optical and radar, based on the range of the electromagnetic spectrum that is covered by uh, the sensors and uh, the ability of uh, uh, sensors in measuring uh, the energy actually in these ranges. And uh, we have optical that covers the visible near infrared and short wave infrared regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. And we have radar, uh, actually, uh, sensors that uh, they uh, capture, actually, they uh, sense, actually sense and also collect data in the range of microwave. And the advantage of radar data compared to optical data is that the radar uh, sensors can collect data or in collect information even. Uh, when the, the weather is cloudy and also we have cloud in the sky and, and they actually waves can pass through the clouds and also aerosols that we have in the atmosphere. But uh, the challenge that we have in processing optical data that is that the, the pre-processing stage is usually time consuming. Sometimes you need also to uh, remove clouds from the images using machine learning as well. And, uh, but uh, in our work, we need to work. Uh, in, actually, in our uh, uh, for mineral exploration, we are usually relied on optical remote sensing data for creating maps. But uh, we can also use uh, radar data for mapping lineaments and also structural units that we have. Uh, uh, in in the following projects that I uh, will go through, then we have used uh, optical remote sensing data in all of them. Uh, that later I will introduce the different data types that we have used. Uh, each remote sensing data have different characteristics. And uh, among all these characteristics, there are four that are more important. We have a spatial resolution, spectral resolution, temporal resolution, and also radiometric resolution. The one that is more important to us here is spectral resolution, that it says you know, how many spectral bands actually we have in our data. And uh, here in this uh, uh, plot, you can see uh, that we have uh, on the x-axis, we have wavelength, and also on the y-axis, we have atmospheric transmission. And uh, where, where actually there is a gap here in, the, in uh, actually in our uh, chart, it shows that the energy is uh, fully absorbed by the atmosphere, by the water vapor or aerosols. And no uh, wave actually in these ranges it gets to the uh, sensors. And uh, so the sen sensors are uh, designed in a way that actually uh, uh, to be able to capture energy in this, these ranges uh, in which we have, you know, we can actually uh, capture energy uh, from them. So, but you can also see that we have a number of spectral bands in these ranges for uh, uh, actually to study atmospheric, uh, atmosphere. And also these bands are uh, critical for meteorologists. And uh, these are some of the uh, sensors that we have in optical remote sensing. We, here we have Sentinel-2, we have Landsat-8, Landsat-7, and also Aster and MODIS. These are some of the famous multispectral sensors that we have in the field. And uh, you can see that each of them uh, covers, a spe uh, covers actually specific ranges of electromagnetic spectra. And based on uh, your need, you actually the user decides what sensor to use and what data type to use. And the range, which is more important to us in geological studies and also in mirror expression, is SWIR. So if uh, there is, a, if our uh, uh, actually sensor uh, has a good resolution in the range of SWIR, so it's 
uh, actually our uh, desired you know, sensor. And uh, uh, it's suitable for doing geological studies. And uh, these are spectral bands that each cover a specific range of electromagnetic spectrum and able to uh, measure uh, energy uh, radiance. Uh, uh, so they actually, they actually kind of measure the average of reflectance in these ranges. And uh, so you can see that here, here is in, on the left side, we have the range of visible uh, in, in, and also in far uh, uh, area. To create a true color image, you need uh, three bands, red, green, and blue. And uh, we have different color systems actually to generate colors. Uh, the famous one is RGB or red, green, blue that is also used in monitors and also in your phones to generate different colors. And uh, but you can see that also in addition to RGB uh, in the range, the range actually that human eye actually can see. Uh, in addition to this range, we have also other uh, uh, ranges that are covered by sensors and they enable us to uh, actually discriminate between different minerals on the ground surface. And it is the using uh, uh, the advantage of using uh, remote sensing. And also the thing that uh, makes uh, James Webb telescope different from Hubble is also this. That actually James Webb Telescope captures data in, uh, also in the infrared range in addition to visible range, but Hubble only covers the visible range, and uh, it makes you know uh, the James Webb teles Telescope also uh, uh, interesting. And uh, these spectral bands you know, are actually uh, each of these spectral bands provide a separate image, and that image is a single feature, which is used as an input to the machine learning algorithms. For example, here we have for Aster, for example, here we have 14 different spectral bands. So we have 14 features and different minerals show uh, so different spectral behavior. For example, one of them shows a high uh, reflect, uh, reflectance in, for example, band number three and high uh, absorption in band number four. And these characteristics makes minerals different from each other. And it enables us to use machine learning and also uh, train and modeling and to actually, uh, to actually map different minerals on the ground surface. Uh, so in the following slides, I briefly will introduce you some of the most popular uh, uh, remote sensing data and satellites that we have uh, uh, actually out there orbiting the Earth. The first one is Landsat. Landsat is not a single satellite. It's actually the name of a program which is led by NASA. And Landsat 1 was launched in 19, uh, 1972. And uh, we have Landsat 1 to 9, and each has a specific uh, spectral resolution, radiometric resolution, spatial resolution, and also temporal resolution. And in our studies, uh, uh, in our actually recent studies, we have used Landsat 8 and 9. And uh, these two actually satellites are very similar to each other. But uh, Landsat 9 uh, provides a higher radiometric resolution, and uh, it enables us to uh, easily discriminate between uh, different uh, minerals. And uh, uh, in addition, actually, uh, so as I said, in our studies, in our recent studies, we have used Landsat 8 and 9. And here in the actually this plot, you can see that uh, how different are the, this, uh, the, actually the ranges that Landsat 8 and 9 cover compared to the previous ones. For example, here we have TM, which is Landsat 5, ETM plus is Landsat 7, and OLI is, uh, and TR, TIRS are the two sensors uh, that, that are, uh, have been actually mounted on Landsat 8, and OLI 2 and TIRS 2 are the sensors that mounted on uh, Landsat 9. And you can see the range of the uh, spectral bands are similar, but as I said, the radiometric resolution of uh, Landsat 9 is higher. And NSS actually is uh, the sensor which is mounted on Landsat 1 to 4. You can see that how the spectral resolution of the land, land, Landsat satellites have improved uh, uh, through time. And uh, also the number of spectral bands, you can see that has increased. Uh, so. Landsat 8 and 9 are uh, two of the data sets that we use. And also the advantage of Landsat program is that it's free and you can download the data for free on, uh, on the websites, you know, supported by NASA and also USGS. Uh, and uh, in addition to Landsat uh, data, we also use Aster in our works. 
Aster is only one of the sensors which have been mounted uh, mounted on Terra platform. Terra is a platform, and there are five sensors mounted on that. Mounted on that, and Aster is one of them, which has been uh, particularly designed for geological studies. And why it is uh, suitable for geological studies? It's because of these bands that you can see here in the range of SWIR. This, as I said before, this range of electromagnetic spectrum is uh, critical for geological studies, and it enables us to discriminate between different minerals that we have. And in particular, it's very useful for mapping alteration zones. For example, discriminating between the alterations that are, rela re that are re related to mineralization and also uh, non-mineralized areas. And uh, in addition to this range, you can see that it also covers VNIR, which is suitable actually to create a true color image of the ground, uh, actually uh, Earth's surface. And also it covers uh, thermal infrared as well. We have, for example, five bands in the range of TIR or thermal, thermal infrared, which is critical for mapping silicified areas that can, you know, in, that can bear uh, gold in, in themselves. Uh, this is, uh, another type of uh, remote sensing data that we use. And uh, the other one is Sentinel. Sentinel, similar to uh, Landsat, is the name of a program, which is led by Air European Space Agency. And uh, under this program, we have uh, uh, seven, actually, satellites. And most of them, uh, uh, actually, uh, most of them have radar sensors. And the only one which is more interesting to us, uh, and uh, we have used its data is Sentinel-2. And uh, it, uh, the reason that it's uh, uh, more useful for geological studies that it, the, the sensor that is, mount, that is mounted on this uh, satellite is actually an uh, uh, optical, optical sensor. And uh, it has uh, uh, several spectral bands and it covers the different ranges of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum similar to Landsat uh, satellite, and the interesting uh, thing about this satellite, it's it's actually a twin satellite, and we have Sentinel two A and Sentinel two B. They are on the same orbit, uh, but actually the position of them on the orbit is different. And uh, the Sentinel two A was launched in twenty fifteen, and Sentinel two two B was launched in twenty seventeen. And the interesting thing about Sentinel-2 is that it, it provides the highest uh, spatial resolution among all the free satellite images that we have out there. And uh, uh, the, uh, also it is noteworthy that I mentioned uh, actually that uh, these satellites that I showed you, they all provide multi-spectral data. And it, there are also some other satellites that are, I can say that all of them are commercial that provide uh, hyperspectral data as well. And the number of spectral bands is over 100. And also they provide a spatial resolution with less than one meter that enable you to do anything that you want with the, these data and detect all the objects that you have on the ground surface easily. And But, the, the, but most of the time in our studies, uh, we need to actually cover a vast area. And it, it makes it difficult actually to buy these data and it, it can cost you a lot. And uh, in our projects, uh, since uh, we were we actually uh, didn't have enough enough fund actually to buy the data from uh, private companies, and so we prefer to work with multi-spectral data and try out the different machine machine learning algorithms and these. But recently, we have also have uh, actually have access to a set of hyperspectral data as well, and we have started also to try actually. Uh, apply machine learning algorithms uh, this type of data as well. Uh, in the, this is the first project that I'm uh, going to talk about uh, uh, today, uh, in which we actually uh, developed a framework uh, and combined stacked autoencoders and also clustering to uh, uh, create a, and generate a geological map. And uh, this, uh, in this actually project, uh, we have, uh, in addition to me, we have uh, three other uh, collaborators. We, ha we had Sandy Negar. Uh, I think he's now a PhD student uh, at uh, International Institute of, uh, Institute of Information Technology in Hyderabad. And, and also we had Joseph Awanj, who is a, a professor of remote sensing at Keratin University, and also Rohit that led the project. Uh, our study area is uh, 
called Muta, Muta uh, Wingy in the west of New South Wales. And uh, it's actually a historic site. And also it's a national park. And uh, we didn't have actually access to many rock samples in the area. And uh, it made us actually to develop an unsupervised learning based framework to create geological maps. And uh, that is one of the reasons that we use the uh, framework based on unsupervised learning in this project. And uh, the thing that is in interesting, also important about the area, it's very close to the uh, Broken Hill and Broken Hill itself is known for uh, several lead zinc and also silver uh, deposits that we have there. And since uh, due to the, uh, since the, uh, our study area is protected and also there is uh, some sensitivity about that. So uh, we thought that it would be interesting to cover that area and also uh, uh, study that area using uh, satellite data without, you know, getting access to the area and also having any uh, a good number of uh, rock samples uh, from there. So uh, most of the time in remote sensing data processing, uh, we have a high number of uh, uh, sp sp spectral bands and also we need to use dimensionality reduction to actually to reduce the uh, dimensionality of our, of our feature space. And it is very common that people use principal component analysis as dimensional reduction method. But in this study, uh, actually, we try to use a different method uh, and we try to use autoencoders uh, to reduce the uh, dimensionality of our feature space. And uh, we also, in addition to autoencoders, uh, uh, the canonical autoencoders, we tried using stacked autoencoders. And uh, well, autoencoder is a uh, consists of an encoder and also a decoder. That encoder actually that, uh, compresses input data into a latent representation and also decoder uh, constructs the input uh, uh, from this representation. And uh, in our study, we use the, the latent space representation actually as our input to the clustering methods. And uh, by actually, uh, we actually try to tra train our model using the latent space representation. For example, we had 14 or 15 spectral bands, each of them, as I said, you know, can be considered as a feature and we reduced the dimensionality to the four or five, for example, using alta encoders. And then we use that as input to k-means and we created clustered maps. And uh, in addition to canonical alta encoders uh, that you can see in the, you know, in figure, sub figure A here, we also used the stacked autoencoders, which are composed of multiple layers of interconnected autoencoders uh, in this study. And as you can see here, the output of uh, each autoencoder serves as the input for the next one. And this cascade, you know, process, you know, this uh, is actually helps us to remove noise as much as possible from the data. And uh, similar uh, to the, you know, as to auto canonical autoencoders, we use the latent space representation as input to our machine learning algorithms and also the clustering method that we had to create a, a clustered map, which has been later interpreted as a geological map. Uh, so this is the framework that uh, is the simplified, you know, version of the framework that we developed. Here we have data acquisition, and then we have radiometric and geometric correction. Based on the level of the data, remote sensing data that we have, we need to apply different types of uh, radiometric and also geometric corrections to the data. And uh, we used level 1T uh, of uh, remote sensing data in our study, and they do not need usually actually to be geometrically corrected, but they need it all to be radiometrically correct corrected. And uh, we uh, actually uh, applied necessary corrections to the uh, remote sensing data. And then uh, we apply, actually uh, used the uh, fuzzy function to do rescaling. And we actually changed the range of the data from zero to one. Uh, and uh, later we actually, in addition to using stacked autoencoder as, uh, the, as our dimensional reduction method, we also used canonical autoencoder and principal component analysis to compare the results. And uh, after doing dimensional to reduction, we used elbow method to determine the uh, optimal number of clusters uh, in k-means clustering. And uh, then later k-means clustering, we created the clustered maps. And finally, we applied majority filtering 
on our final our on our cluster maps to make them less pic to make the maps less pixelated and make it more uniform uh, uh, maps uh, from the study area and finally we created a cluster maps as I said you know, we, which can be interpreted as a, uh, a, a geological map later and uh, so in this study actually in addition to uh, these three methods, we applied our framework to three, uh, to three different types of remote sensing data as well. We applied it to Landsat 8, Aster, and Sentinel-2. Landsat 8, actually, the resolution of Landsat 8 uh, is 30 meters. The resolution of Aster data is uh, uh, 15 meters. And the resolution of Sentinel-2 is 10 meters. So in addition to comparing these uh, uh, dimension reduction methods and their efficiencies, uh, we their efficiency, we also uh, compared the results uh, and also the effect of a spatial resolution on the maps. And uh, it is noteworthy that uh, spectral bands that we have in, a, for example, in a, uh, uh, that, uh, that are provided you know, by a sensor, for example, by Landsat 8 or Astor, for example, they do not all have the same sp spatial resolution. And uh, in some case, actually, for some spectral bands, we had to use nearest neighbor, for example, to increase their spatial resolution, for example, from 30, you know, to 15 in the case of, for example, Aster. For example, in Aster, the, uh, the spectral bands that we have in the range of VNIR, their spatial resolution is 15 meters, but the, the bands that cover the SWIR region, uh, their spatial resolution is 30. So we also use the nearest neighbor actually to make the spatial resolution of the all the spectral bands the same. And uh, on the left here, you can see the elbow plots that we created for uh, uh, different uh, pairs of satellite data and also dimension RT reduction methods. And we uh, determined you know, and, uh, the optimal uh, number of clusters for each of these pairs of uh, data types and also dimension RT reduction methods that I mentioned. And the, these, nine, these nine cluster maps that you can see on the right side uh, are actually the final results that we got. And uh, to compare uh, the results and evaluate the efficiency of uh, uh, using different uh, satellite data and also uh, the modular reduction methods, we use the two different metrics called one is one of them is called Kalinsky Harabas, and the other one is called Davis Boulding. And uh, they actually are, they rely on the distance between the uh, data points that we have in each cluster. And uh, so, and they calculate the distance between the uh, clusters and uh, the, the data points that we have in clusters in different ways. And in the case of uh, Kolinsky Harabas, uh, the higher score actually shows uh, uh, more efficient models. But in the case of Davis Bolden, the lower value of the scores that we have shows the uh, actually uh, the, the better performance by the models. And uh, by looking at the results, we see that. Uh, uh, for example, if we consider only a Kolinsky Harabas, we can see that uh, the pair of you know a stacked out encoder and uh, also uh, Sentinel two uh, provides the best results. And also, if we have a look at uh, Davis Boulding, we can see the pair of uh, Aster and uh, the stacked out encoder provides the best result. And uh, as I said, the, the special uh, the Sentinel two provides the highest spatial resolution, and it's uh, ten meters. And uh, usually in geological studies and using uh, uh, conventional methods, you, you are not able actually to provide a, a geological map with this high resolution. And this is the advantage of using remote sensing data in geological studies. And so we've been able to use a, an unsupervised learning method here uh, and uh, without using any rock samples and create a, a geological map you know, in which we can discriminate between different uh, geological units that we have on the ground, only based on the spectral behavior that uh, the objects on the surface show. And in addition uh, to the metrics that I mentioned, we had also access to a few only uh, rock samples. Uh, and uh, we actually accessed uh, these, uh, uh, these data you know, uh, uh, from MinV website, which is supported and supplied by Geological Survey of NSW. And also we, uh, uh, evaluated the performance of different methods and also different uh, data types uh, based on uh, the rock samples that are available in the study area. And uh, the numbers that you see in this table, uh, table they're actually the overall accuracy of the maps that we have created only based on you know, these rock samples. 
And again, you see that the pair of you know Sentinel two and also stacked out encoders results in the highest accuracy, which is zero point nine. And the accuracy is simply calculated, you know, based on the uh, 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 correctly predicted uh, values uh, and samples uh, over uh, the total number of uh, samples that we had. And uh, then we actually interpreted the, our geo, our uh, clustered map, and uh, we, uh, you know, assigned uh, actually uh, we actually, you know, uh, determined the uh, lithology type that is correlated with each of these colors that you can see on the map. And this way, actually, you know, we created a geologic map only based on the spectral information that uh, have been captured uh, by the sensors or satellites that uh, are orbiting the air. And, uh, yep. And uh, in the second project, uh, we used uh, a supervised learning uh, approach uh, and uh, we used CNN this time to create alteration maps. And uh, the collaborators that we had in this project uh, were, you know, Dakshi and also Diraj, that uh, they're, they're both with uh, the Indian Institute of uh, Technology Jammu, in Jammu. And also we had Dietmar, actually Dietmar recently joined uh, this project and uh, also who is actually my supervisor at the University of Sydney. And also Ruhit uh, led uh, this project again. And uh, you can see on the right side, you can see the, the geological map of the study area and where actually we, we targeted. And this uh, area is actually in the west of New South Wales and it's in the north of Broken Hill. And as I said, there are uh, several uh, uh, lead, lead, zinc and silver deposits in the study area hosted by sulfur uh, rocks. And I don't get into the geological settings of the study area, but uh, just notice that this area is really uh, interesting for the geologists, and it is known, well known for the mineralization deposit and mineral deposits that we have there. And uh, so, in this study, uh, in addition to comparing the efficiency of uh, CNN or convol convolutional neural networks uh, with other tra with traditional uh, supervised learning methods, we also tested the application of two different sets of training samples. One of these, uh, uh, one, the first set of training samples that we created, it was only based on the uh, ground, with, based on ground truth data, and the data provided by the Geological Survey of New South Wales, and uh, all the open uh, open access reports that are uh, that are out there. We actually relied on those data and created uh, these two maps, you know, and uh, for uh, two uh, actually uh, three different types of uh, uh, alteration zones or, or alteration types. Using uh, and also in, in this study, we used three different uh, types of remote sensing data: Landsat eight, nine, and Aster. And uh, since uh, we, when we started doing this project, Landsat nine was recently launched, and uh, we were interested in evaluating the you know differences uh, of uh, Landsat eight and nine and see if Landsat nine is superior you know compared to Landsat eight. So uh, this was also in our, in our, in, 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 in the other goal that we had in the study. And uh, it's also interesting to know that, uh, also good to know that Landsat, using Landsat 8 and 9, uh, we are only able to uh, map argillate and iron oxide areas. And the reason is uh, because of the spectral be uh, behavior that uh, the indicative minerals of these uh, zones of alteration show. And uh, using Aster, we were uh, uh, only uh, able to uh, uh, map argillate and propolitic areas. Uh, this is also, again, because of the spectral behavior and the spectral graphs of the minerals that are indica indicative of these alteration zones. And uh, so we created these two uh, sets of uh, training samples based on only ground truth data to train our models. And uh, it is, again, noteworthy to say that the spatial resolution for Landsat 8 and 9 here is 30 meters, and the spatial resolution for Aster data set that we use as input to our uh, 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 training process is 15 meters. And uh, so since uh, the spatial resolution for Landsat 8 and 9 are the same, and also the extent of the study area is the same, so we use the same set of uh, samples for these two. But the set of samples uh, which we, we, that we use for Aster is fully different. And also the alteration types that we are able to map using Aster is different from Landsat 8 and 9. And all these uh, three uh, types of alteration zones are very helpful to uh, find uh, potential areas of mineralization 
on the ground surface. And uh, in addition to uh, this set of uh, training samples, we also use the PCA or selective uh, PCA, uh, 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 which is uh, for actually creating a set of training samples as well. And uh, this approach uh, is actually, uh, this set of samples has been created via, based on our previous study published in Remote Sensing Journal. Uh, and uh, the, actually the, uh, in, this in this actually uh, approach, the thing that we do, we rely on the eigenvector loadings that we have uh, from uh, PCA. And uh, based on them, we choose the best PC actually or principal component for mapping the alteration zones. And then by uh, by considering a threshold for the, the pixels, uh, we actually create a training, a set of training samples. And for example, uh, for Landsat 8 and 9, again, we created two different sets of uh, uh, samples uh, for uh, iron oxide areas and also uh, argillic alteration zones. And we created a set of samples for uh, Aster data to map argillic alteration zone and also propylitic alteration zone. Uh, as I said, they are very critical, uh, very, imp very important to map potential uh, mineralization areas. And uh, so we have now two sets of training samples, one created only based on ground truth data and the other one is only uh, relies on uh, print PCA and principal component analysis. And uh, so that set of sample has been created uh, automatically. Uh, without considering any ground uh, truth uh, data. So our goal was actually, uh, in addition to testing, as I said, in addition to testing the uh, performance of CNN, was also uh, 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 to evaluate the, uh, if actually the effect of, and also the effect of quality of training samples on uh, the final accuracy that we have for our model. So here is the, uh, actually uh, here on the right side, you can, uh, uh, for in sub figure A and B, you can see the architecture of uh, also MLP. And in our, uh, uh, actually study, in addition uh, to actually evaluate the performance of uh, CNN, we uh, we compared the results with MLP, multi-layer perceptron, and also SVM, support vector machine. And uh, in sub figure A, you can see the architecture of, the MLP that we used for uh, classifying uh, uh, images for Landsat 8 and 9. And also the, in subfigure B, you can see the architecture of the MLP for uh, processing Aster data. And uh, you can see that the number of input features uh, is uh, higher for Aster data, which is 9. And also for Landsat 8 and 9, it's 7. And it is also, again, noteworthy to mention that we don't use all the spectral bands of Landsat 8 and 9 and also Aster as input. We only use those uh, spectral bands that cover our the ranges that are actually ideal for discriminating between different minerals. For example, we have 14 spectral bands in uh, Aster data, but we only use nine of them. And uh, in, uh, in Landsat data, we have, for example, 11 spectral bands, but we only use seven of them. And these are, we actually, uh, I've done a literature review and do it on that, and actually we uh, selected these bands based on previous studies. And uh, here in subfigure C, you can see the structure of the architecture of the convolution neural networks that we use in our study. And so, as you know, CNNs are a class of deep learning uh, models, and they are specifically designed to uh, for tasks involving really structured data, such as images, and for example, in this case, satellite images. And uh, they employ convolutional layers to systematically analyze local patterns in the data and uh, through layered filters capturing hierarchical features. And uh, we have pooling layers and also fully connected layers in this architecture of uh, uh, CNN. And uh, pooling layers are often used to downsample and reduce dimensionality, preserving important features. And also we use fully connected layers at the end of the uh, network to integrate uh, learn features for final predictions. And uh, the thing which is uh, a bit challenging for C uh, training CNN is the hyperparameter tuning. And also it's uh, sometimes time consuming to apply that to remote sensing data. And since in our case, our study area was quite large, so it took a long time actually to run, the C run CNN uh, to classify our images. And it was the main challenge that we had. Also, it's a bit tricky to, uh, tune the hyperparameters that we have in uh, for in CNN. And uh, 
this is also the framework that we uh, designed, uh, the simplified version of the framework that we designed uh, uh, to apply CNN and also to other uh, cl uh, classifier classification methods to our data. So it starts with data acquisition, pre-processing, and data scaling, similar to the our previous uh, framework. And then we create our two sets of training samples, as I explained, and uh, then we apply these three classifiers, SVM, MLP, and CNN to the data. And uh, after that, we actually uh, uh, carry out the hyperparameter tuning. And finally, we evaluate the performance metrics. And based on that, we decide to tune the hyperparameters further and also retrain the data or our, our model or not. And finally, we create our alteration map. And uh, so th these are the final maps that we uh, created uh, using this framework. So as I mentioned, we applied three different classification methods, SVM, MLP, and CNN, uh, to three different uh, sets of remote sensing data, Landsat 8, 9, and Aster, uh, that each has you know, uh, specific characteristics. And uh, in addition to that, we use two different sets of training samples. One uh, is only based on ground truth data, and the other one is uh, based on PCA. And uh, as you can see in the maps, you can see that uh, in the uh, in the maps uh, created using ground truth data, we have less noise. And also uh, also for our Ar Argilic alteration, you can see that the maps created uh, using CNN uh, for Ar Argilic alteration is less noisy. And also, you can see that uh, uh, the areas that uh, are you know, mapped as probabilistic alteration by Aster data in the uh, lower, actually low, they're also less uh, noisy when we use a CNN. And uh, uh, we also uh, calculated different metrics to evaluate the performance of uh, different classifiers that we had. And, uh, in addition to, uh, to the accuracy that we calculated uh, for uh, uh, both models, uh, we also calculated uh, the accuracy based on ground truth data for the uh, models created based on PCA as well. And so to, uh, two columns that are here more important to us is this one here, the accuracy for the model created using, uh, ground, uh, uh, using the training set based on ground truth data, and also the last column that we have here. And uh, by investigating the results, uh, we saw that the average accuracy that we have for CNN and also uh, uh, for, uh, for Aster data and also um, uh, the set of data created using uh, uh, ground truth data is higher and it shows less uh, noise in the data. And uh, this table here actually uh, shows the results only for CNN. And uh, since I, I actually didn't want to make, uh, make it a bit more uh, more confusing, so I prefer to only present the data, the table for CNN. And uh, the re actually the accuracy for uh, SVM and MLP, uh, actually their average accuracy that they provided is uh, lower than CNN. And based on the different uh, data sets and also input data sets and also the training sets that we use, we realized that Aster and also uh, the ground truth data provide a higher accuracy when we actually map argillic and propolitic areas. And uh, the interesting thing was uh, that we realized that Landsat 9 is superior uh, to uh, Landsat, uh, superior than uh, Landsat uh, 8 actually for mapping iron oxide areas. And also, uh, we re uh, since we mapped argillic alteration zones using both Landsat data and also Aster, we also investigated the efficiency of these two uh, satellite data, and we, re we realized that Aster data, due to higher number of spectral bands that we have, is uh, actually uh, superior, and it's the preferred uh, set of data to map uh, argillic alteration zones. And uh, in addition to these metrics, we also uh, plotted uh, receiver operating characteristics, characteristic uh, uh, graphs, and uh, so on the x-axis of uh, these plots, we have false positive rate, and, and on the y-axis, we have true positive rate, and the area under the curve shows the accuracy of our models. And uh, the interesting thing was uh, the, the plot that you can see here on the right side, and you can see that when we try to train the CNN model using uh, the training set uh, based on PCA, we actually get uh, this unexpected uh, graphs that uh, and the, the lower the lowest accuracy that 
uh, we had among all the models. And uh, we realized it can be maybe due to uh, uh, high, high, the high, uh, the, actually due to the noisy data set that we have there. And uh, we realized that sensitive is uh, very, actually, uh, that CNN is very sensitive to noisy data. And it's, uh, it's, it is really important to choose a reliable set of training samples to train CNN. And uh, we also understood that CNN is more sensitive to uh, noisy data, you know, compared to MLP and SVN. And uh, so to summarize, actually, uh, uh, we uh, based on our fra the framework that we developed for uh, uh, unsupervised uh, 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 learning, based on unsupervised learning and for mapping geological units, we realized that the combination of stacked out encoders and Sentinel-2 is ideal for creating a cluster map, as a, which can be interpreted as a geological map later. And uh, uh, we, and this can be due to high, the higher resolution of Sentinel to compared to Landsat and also a Landsat and also a Aster data, and uh, also the cascade uh, process and also the hierarchical process that we have in stacked out encoders. You know, and and since the no noise in the data is removed in multiple multiple steps, so it can also result in the uh, better actually uh, clustered maps and. Uh, this framework can be used in uh, for to actually map areas that we can have we can't have easily access to them and there are not enough number of uh, training samples available from them so this framework can be applied to those areas and uh, it can uh, create a uh, more reliable map you know compared to traditional methods that are only rely that only rely on uh, uh, ground truth data and also rock samples collected from the ground and uh, also, the other advantage of uh, this uh, uh, method and framework is that you can create a, a geological map uh, in a short time also based on that and for vast areas, for example. And uh, when we uh, are at the stage of general, uh, at the stage of reconnaissance and also prospectivity for, uh, for the deposits, so this uh, framework can be uh, efficient. And uh, in the case of second project, we uh, realized and, uh, that uh, the combination of CNN and also uh, Aster is ideal for uh, mapping ultra uh, argillic alteration zones, which include uh, clay minerals, and uh, they can you know help us to find porphyry copper deposits that are the main supplier of copper uh, on Earth. And uh, also the combination of CNN and Landsat nine can help us to map iron oxide areas uh, efficiently. And uh, also we, we realized that <coughs> CNN is more sensitive uh, compared to uh, SVM and also MLP to noisy data. And uh, we also uh, concluded that using uh, ground truth based data uh, also or set of training samples is a uh, preferred compared to the one uh, which has been, uh, which was created using PCA. And uh, so the quality of data is uh, play, plays a key role actually in creating a, an accurate model uh, using CN and also other supervised learning methods. And uh, these are the main references that we used in our studies. And uh, so, as I said, uh, the selective PCA method that we used to create a, a set of training samples. Uh, was actually based on uh, our previous study, which is this one. So you can have a look if you're interested in. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Esan, for an excellent uh, presentation. May I take some questions from the floor? Yes. Um, so what... Uh, what does an actual feature set for each radar image? So, what are the actual features? For radar? Right. Well, in the radar, actually, we have uh, we have different ranges also the microwave, you know. Uh, so, but the number of. Yes, yeah. And, and, and yeah, we have only one or two, actually, only set of features in the case of radar data. And uh, in those, Actually, when we want to process radar data, we usually use convolutional filters and we map linear events using convolutional filters. And also we use edge detection methods and you know, similar methods actually to map the edges and also which can be interpreted as linear events. Uh, 
Mm, yes, it can be said. Yeah. And also they can be used to uh, create uh, them digital elevation models as well, uh, the radar data sets. And uh, in our work in mineral exploration, linium is also important to map potential areas since uh, we have something called hydrothermal fluids when they can't actually ascend from the magma, you know, to this uh, ground surface. So faults that we have uh, on the ground surface and they're represented as lines on the ground surface, they're actually work, uh, they're like conduits, you know, for these fluids, you know, to travel to the ground surface and they form the mineral deposits near ground surface. So mapping lineaments is also important in geological studies and mapping potential areas as well. So yeah, radar data sets, can be also important for us as well. But so like going back to say that plus you need plot to shine. So like one particular pixel in that plot would have a series of these features. Uh in radar data sets? Yeah. In radar data sets, as I said, we have only one or two features usually. Yeah, one or two values. So it actually the number of features is not as high as optical data. And yeah. The, actually, the, most of the research that I see in the scope of radar data processing is on developing edge detection methods and you know, these kind of methods for mapping you know, the edges and these things. And we also we have also uh, published a paper previously, um, actually uh, on a framework uh, that we developed for mapping tectonic limits using optical data. But uh, yeah, maybe in future we can also define a few projects on radar data processing as well. And as I said, the advantage of using the radar data is that they can pass through the uh, clouds and also water vapor and on aerosols. And it's, it's, it's actually a big advantage of them. No. Yeah. yeah, I haven't seen many papers on, you know, using uh, supervised learning methods for processing radar data. Yeah. Probably you'll have to use multiple sources of data. Yeah, we can integrate, yeah. yeah. We can integrate radar data with, with optical data, maybe. Yes, that would be great. Yeah. I have another question. Is it about the first the project we created the uh, map? Then when you created the labels for those particular maps, was it based on the ground data? Yes, yeah, based on the rock samples that we have. Since yeah, we had only 20 or 25, you know, samples from that. So, and they were not enough actually to train our model using supervised learning. So yeah, we only use them to you know create that legend that I showed you. That's, that's my expectation. That it was yeah. Yeah, this legend, yeah, is only based on, you know, the rock sample from the back here. Uh, in the cases where you had different colors overlapping? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you can see that we don't have the accuracy of one there. So yeah. obviously, yes, we have. How do you deal with this? Uh, we actually, we, you know, we visually actually interpreted that with a ge geological map. Oh. And uh, so we take the majority of the sample. That fall within a cluster. Yeah. Yeah. So it won't involve with some inaccuracy. Yeah. All, right. Yeah. All right. Thank uh, you, Elsa. Yeah. Just two more sort of questions. Yeah. So with the supervised method with the sand, uh, you said that the sand had three points. Given like this, given the context of what you use, what, how do you define those? Like what? Like how, how can you say something? Yeah, the error is that we have the sensors actually. And also uh, this is the, the actually the setup training sample that we created using PCA as well. So uh, the noise was, uh, we realized that the noise was higher for PCA you know, uh, data and uh, uh, with the setup training samples that we created using uh, PCA. And uh, it's actually um, the source of this noise is the sensor itself. And since we relied only on the, you know, the satellite data, so it was obvious to us actually, it is clear why we have higher noise with this set of training samples compared to the one we created only using ground truth data. And uh, the noise can be the result of, you know, the actually since the 
when the sun you know emits to the ground surface and it comes back to the satellite so two times it goes through the you know atmosphere and also water vapor aerosol so it can cause you know some distortion and so uh, this is the main source of the noise that we have in the in satellite images and we try to remove this noise as much as possible by applying radiometric corrections to the data and we also did this in the in our project but uh, never you can uh, remove the whole noise that you have in your data set. So, yeah. yeah. So you're saying, so we're talking about those accounts for the actual, the raw data sensor. Yes, yeah, the raw data. What about in terms of saying like sparsing of what you actually get? Yes, yeah. For example, uh, if, you, if you have a look here, you know, here, here is the ground pixels are purplitic data. You never have, you know, such pattern of purplitic yeah. alteration on the ground surface. So it is obvious to us that it's it's actually a no, it's noise. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually in this project, we were not aimed at this, you know, to actually, yeah. and uh, we only tested, you know, we, we didn't touch the result that we got from PCA. And we used, the same, you know, they just said as input to, it, to train our model. But yeah, this actually set of training samples can be improved, you know, if we apply uh, actually other methods or, you know, uh, do some pre-processing on that prior to using that as input to the machine learning algorithms. But uh, yeah. So, okay. Thanks, I think we can have more discussions later. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Esther. Yeah, no worries, Michael.